just got hustled by a man, man. Peace to the world. What's good, y'all? Uh, welcome back to the MCAD Thoughts on Life. <laughs> Thoughts on modern issues, old issues. Uh, 400 years of slavery. Kanye West is in the news. That's what we're talking about today. So uh, Kanye West on TMZ Live causing a stir in everybody natural social media you see polarizing aggressive arguments debating instead of dialectical um 400 years of slavery slavery in general is a choice so uh we're just looking at that given my thoughts um it's always good to define things so let's just look at some definitions on slavery before we even start to try to break this topic down uh let's see this is from The Webster's Dictionary, definition of slavery, drudgery, toil, uh, submission to dominating influence, the state of a person who is chattel of another, the practice of slaveholding. That's uh, Webster's Dictionary. And let's go to Black's Law Dictionary. Black's Law Dictionary has slavery as a situation in which one person has absolute power over the life, fortune, and liberty of another. The practice of keeping individuals in such a state of bondage or servitude. Slavery was outlawed by the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So that's a starting point. Um, I don't know if that's a big debate of what actual slavery is. Um, If that's what Kanye West meant. Actual slavery versus mental slavery. A choice or uh, a form of domination. So we're going to go with actual slavery with this definition, you know, of having your will taken away, having your freedom of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, restricted by force, typically violence, and uh, to become chattel to somebody else. Uh, I think it's important to differentiate between indentured servitude and slavery. Indentured servitude was obviously a thing as well and I think uh, can be distinguished as something different than slavery, where there was some, more like a contract, some agreed benefit to endangered servitude. In the same way that I think you see today, you know, maybe doing something not as your preference or your first choice, um, but something you're going to benefit from. Indentured servitude, you could get land, if we're talking about, you know, the 1600s, and uh, being in servitude to somebody in America and the original colonies and then getting something of wealth upon your completion of servitude of of the contract. Very different than slavery, capturing somebody, uh, holding somebody by force against their will, no benefit to them, um, strictly a benefit to the slave owner, the dominator. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's pretty cut and dry, the differences in slavery to indentured servitude, which gets into Kanye West statement, slavery by force, slavery by choice. Um, Let's just talk about slaves, many slaves throughout history, black slaves, white slaves. Um, You do realize that it is said that the word slave comes from the word Slav, Slovakian, white slaves. Um, So the connotation of slave in the etymology in itself comes from Europeans, not black American slave, which is what the world typically thinks of nowadays when we speak about slaves and slavery and the slave trade is usually referenced and epitomized by the transatlantic slave, the concept of 1600s to the 1800s, bringing Africans by force from West Africa to the Americas. So. It's, it's important to understand that slavery has a long history. Domination has a long history. War has a long history. Um, oppression against people, you know, certainly didn't start with the transatlantic slave concept. Um, it's obvious Moors throughout history had plenty of slaves. Uh, indigenous people warred with each other, conquered and colonized people. 
um, took captives, prisoners of war, slavery in general. So slavery isn't a new concept just to be restricted to America, the transatlantic slave and uh, the concept of black African slaves in America. Slavery has been done to many nations, and you know that's an important part of the conversation so we don't just get pigeonholed in now what we see in the conversation around slavery and the polarization and the offense that you see in Europeans to you know white guilt and the idea that Europeans are the only slaveholders or uh, white the only white supremacy and devils <laughs> things that you hear you know things that I've heard in my studies of uh, black pride, black power, black nationalism, black freedom, indigenous freedom, red pride, red sovereignty, um, red freedom. So uh, it's important to understand white pride, white sovereignty, white freedom, <laughs> the fact that whites were slaves as well. So this is should not be a one-sided conversation just from the onset. That's important, I think, to bring to the table uh, to create dialectical as opposed to debates and polarized debates at that. So uh, we will focus on black American, African slavery, transatlantic slaves in America, um, because that's mostly what people generalize. And in a lot of the comments around Kanye West and his statements, it's a conversation typically strictly revolving around the black American slave. Um, 400 years, the concept of black American slaves for 400 years, which I think implies, you know, the beginning of the first so-called black slaves from West Africa to Virginia, 1600s, whatnot. Um, I guess up to the year 2000 or something. Uh, 400 years, 16, 17, 1800s, 1900s. So the concept of 400 years, you know, we've heard lots of places. Peter Tosh, Bob Marley, 400 years. Um, this concept has been going around, this idea of 400 years of slavery. And so it's important to break that down. It's a term that I've used, and I'll address that on my song, The Man, um, but not just there. Uh, and so it's important to understand what I mean. I know what I mean but I might not know exactly what Bob Marley meant or Peter Tosh meant or Kanye West exactly meant or you know, black Americans when they're talking about it. Anybody who uses the frame, it's just good to define what do you mean before we even get to arguing and resentful, hateful retaliation and defensiveness. So um, just talking about slavery in America, 400 years, is my understanding, actual legal slavery in America, uh, we could give maybe 200, 250 years um, from Virginia to the Civil War, Emancip Emancipation Proclamation, um, 1865. So it's typically considered, you know, 16, early 1600s to the middle of the 1800s, right? So just on the history of America, that's that's not 400 years of actual slavery. That's 200 years. And so, um, you know, some say the, the stronghold of North American slavery is 1700s. And that's not even getting into who were the slave owners. Were there black slave owners? There were certainly black slave owners, indigenous slave owners, obviously white European slave owners. I don't think anybody denies or debates that. Um, but it's just getting into the basic numbers of American legalized slavery, active practice slavery. We're talking 100 to 250 years in America. So where do the where do the 400 years come from? You know, up to today, through Jim Crow, through you know uh, the civil rights movement, you know, and these uh, connotations and comparisons to the actual legal slavery to modern day slavery or slave mentality. Um, I think it's important to talk about the transatlantic slave. I'm of the belief and opinion, and I'll say knowledge, uh, that there's still a debate even between 
the indigenous population on Turtle Island in America. We know Columbus was taking indigenous people from the Americas east. So it's, it, there's just a lot to be understood. We're not on the same page as a culture, first of all, about slavery, even in America, the transatlantic slave. I'm not gonna get too much into the transatlantic slave if there were really you know, 400 people on a wooden ship, shackled, without anywhere to shit and piss, right? Um, if this is even possible, where they held the water, where these ships are today. It's allegedly ships down in South America. Or the high number of slaves um, that were traveling west that went to South America. That's the majority of where people brought against their will went in the Americas, were South America, into the Caribbean, the islands, the holding islands, and then the smallest percentage into North America. So that's a conversation of its own, and there's a, uh, there's a difference in philosophy between, let's say, what we'll call the Red the Plains, Indians, indigenous. I think it's still funny and silly that we're using the word Indians, but um, the indigenous population of America to the what we would consider black, you know, looking African, so-called African indigenous. And so, you know, I'm of the belief that there were plenty of more as dark black African looking indigenous from the Olmec, the rubber people, to North America, to Queen Khalifa, California on the West Coast, to the Choctaw and the Geechee and the East Coast um, to the Seminoles uh, and the depictions that we see even from the white Europeans that were coming over and some of the first people they met weren't all straight hair, what we classify as red natives, red indigenous Indians. Um, so that's a topic of itself. But it's important to understand, and it's important to understand that there's not an agreement between black indigenous, between red indigenous, and between white indigenous or white Europeans, immigrants, whatever your belief is on history and people. There, I just think it's important to acknowledge that history is not something that we're all in agreement with. And so it's good to be open to the conversation in general as a means of dialectical to come to truth and further understanding and higher, wiser understanding. So um, my belief is I'm, an, I'm indigenous to America, um, both in the typical red indigenous as well as the black indigenous. And I also have European ancestry. So I'm, I'm the trifecta. And I think that's part of the reason I have a passion and investment in the so-called, especially in America, the three big races and then Latino and obviously what we call Mexican, which gets into the same thing. What was indigenous down there, down to the Olmecs, and then with Spanish conquest and colonization and the mixing over hundreds of years that has gone on, you know, that's now created a very confusing modern day human um, with no detriment in and of itself to that mixing, but in the understanding of self-identity, nationalization, the concept of race. Um, they're really important things that still beg to be discussed. And so I think that's why even with the Kanye West, we see a big response to comments about slavery about slave mentality, because it brings up all of these issues. So um, with Kanye West specifically, actual slavery, mental slavery, you know, people are obviously upset that he's uh, like a Holocaust denier, that he's denying any form of black slavery in America as anything but a choice. I think that's silly. I don't think that's what he was implying. He, I, hence in the notion of 400 years because actual black slavery in America did not last 400 years. And so I think it's implied in that comment that to be a slave for 400 years, which acknowledges modern day, that 
it incorporates the concept of mental slavery. So actual slavery, you know, we could talk about Bob Marley. Oh, pirates, yes, they rabbi, sold I to the merchant ships. That's a reference to West Africa, to blacks being taken from West Africa, the pirate ships, brought in the transatlantic slave trade to the Americas. Um, actual slavery. Now, I think it's important to go do your research. Slaves were going both ways. Columbus was taking indigenous slaves and indige indigenous indentured servitude to the East. And so, you know, most people just, their concept of slavery in general is not very informed, um, historically, factually, on things you can evidence. So the actual slavery is a fact, going both ways from many nationalities, different races, uh, that's real. I don't know who would deny that, and I don't think the Kanye West is denying that in any way. Um, mental slavery. That's the other line. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. That's the exact same song, Redemption Song, Bob Marley. So in one song, you got kind of what people are talking about on both sides of the argument with the Kanye West. So it's actual slavery, pirates, yes, they rabbi. Pirates came and took physical bodies, put them in slave ships, and emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. Only you can free your mind. That's mental slavery, that's self-responsibility. So I think it's a beautiful thing to acknowledge Bob Marley, a timeless artist, and how in one song he's addressing both sides of this argument, mental slavery actual slavery. So I think mental slavery, slave mentality, it's a complex topic in and of itself, but that gets into hermetic principles, mentalism. Do we create our reality? Are we living in a, you know, a holographic universe, um, simulation? <laughs> do we create, do thoughts create things? Um, the law of attraction, obviously, is a part of that. The secret and, you know, Abraham Hicks, Seth, all these, a lot of new age philosophies on energetic manifestation, our ability to control and influence manifestation through intent, through feeling, through vibration, which I also subscribe to and understand when Kanye West is talking about mental slavery. Uh, but it's a complex issue, and it gets really wishy-washy. There's obviously references in the Bible, too, to prayer, to holding faith in that which you seek to see, and so it will be. And I think in the age of science, as science the new religion, there's obviously a lot of scrutiny to these concepts, to mentalism, to her the hermetic principles. If you could just manifest through thoughts if you can I've done a video on this already I'll put a link in the bottom but you know thought manifestation versus uh, science through actual work through circumstance through things within our control and things outside of our control um, we're not in agreement on this some of us have never even thought about it so to hear a concept of mental slavery or slavery by choice or poverty mentality is a big one um, is easy to get lost and confused and uh, offended and defensive. So uh, poverty mentality, I think, uh, is a real thing. It's a real thing in America. It's a real thing in the world. You certainly can uh, hold yourself back, have self-doubt, not have been raised and conditioned with courage and belief and strong work ethic. And so um, we see a lot of that, you know, conflict with uh, the, the bifurcation, the polarization between cultures, between demographics in America. I think the race tension that we see going on, you know, it's, you can see it. You can see it in the YouTube and the commentary from 
not just white conservatives, you know, it's not a conservative versus liberal thing to me, although that definitely exemplifies it in what we see in politics and YouTube. Uh, but, you know, there's a white sentiment that slavery's done, white guilt should not be continued today. These people weren't slave owners, and people in black culture are doing things to uh, promote their own violence, their own downfall, uh, lack of wealth, lack of opportunity. And there's the adverse, you know, of whites denying, not relating to, you know, so called white privilege, which I have a problem with white privilege, I think. Uh, white advantage, maybe it's semantics, that's a topic in and of itself, but white advantage. People are comfortable and more familiar with that, which it relates to them, looks like them, sounds like them. So that's, I don't think in and of itself is nefarious, is evil, is oppressive. Um, it's just a fact. And I think the same applies in black America, the same applies in red America, indigenous America. And uh, people feel comfortable and relate to things that they see in their everyday. And so I do think that creates an advantage. And in America, the brown is minority now. And so that's an advantage to white people in and of itself because, you know, if you're de if it's a white boss and you're dealing with Jamal or Akbar or something like that or, um, you know, Red Feather, you know, some core indigenous people, there's going to be a natural tendency to immediately relate and identify with Steve or Tina or people that look and sound like them. And I don't think that in and of itself inhibits freedom, inhibits free trade in the free market in any way, shape or form. But to deny that it's there um, just because of this anti, like, white supremacy doesn't exist, white supremacy is dead, there's not systematic racism, um, I think is just as silly as the adverse of saying that it's all white supremacy, that there is no self-responsibility in the black community, in the red community, uh, for self-determination. So that gets to modern slavery, Kanye West. Mental slavery implies, the 400 years implies modern slavery. So with modern slavery, um, I don't think in America we're dealing with <laughs> modern slavery. To compare what we have now as blacks, as reds, as whites, to the past, to the 1800s, 1600s, <laughs> is offensive. It doesn't even compare, because we're nowhere near that. We're nowhere near Jim Crow laws and the 60s getting hosed and dogs sicked on us. Um, it's nothing like that either. And, you know, there's the argument that slavery, oppression isn't gone, it's just changed form. And so for me to address modern slavery, uh, I usually do it in the form of usury, um, which I also, also think implies surety. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I'll try to put up a uh, the definitions of those. Usury and surety is usury just uh, the money changers, you know. Rich aren't bad in a free market society inherently. I happen to believe in, in an elite uh, group of people, the money changers, the Federal Reserve by itself, uh, the, the, the bankers that own that, the 13 families, and people that control the interest rate of all money in circulation. And I believe usury exists in America. And it's part of my problem with conservatives today because they just praise Western American values and the free market, free market capitalism without really addressing usury as though there's not this wicked interest rate through the Federal Reserve that has nothing to do with the federal government, which should be very limited to begin with, but even with that, the Treasury does not print our money. The private bank does, and private centralized banking is the death of humanity. So to have these conservatives and the politicians all in general, you know, from Ron Paul probably being the last one that I saw in the 
mainstream public eye that was really addressing the Federal Reserve and implications of usury. You just don't see it, and I think that's disingenuous as well because it's the closest thing to modern-day slavery and human trafficking is having an interest rate on fiat currency which is backed by nothing that's made out of nothing, made out of thin air and um, fractional lending, you know, nine times, ten times to the, every dollar at an interest rate that is, you know, it's a Ponzi. If they lend out a dollar and you owe that dollar plus a dollar, there's nowhere to get that extra dollar but the people that lend it to you. And so it's a cyclical form of lending that can never be truly paid back. And we see that in the national debt. We see that in the deflation of the value of the dollar and inflation in the market prices, which again, you know, in a society where public education is dumbing down everybody from history to civics and uh, what the country was allegedly based on where it's at now. Democracy versus a republic, you know, in and of itself is <laughs> just ignorant to most people and not even a part of the conversation. That's a little far from 400 years of slavery, but when you get into, if we're going to talk about it, it's the closest thing I think we have right now to slavery is the fiat currency and centralized banking, usury, interest rates that really can never be paid back. And uh, again, that let's get to Kanye West's statement. Is that mental slavery? Is that a choice? Is that propaganda and conditioning by really powerful people? You know, no more free media. So the information we get through the media, it's not really a free public schools because I believe that was developed by the Rockefellers and you know, the psychologists that spent a lot of time studying the Prussian model of conditioning. And these are all things I address in my music. But what is that? What is your free will in that? It's it's an interesting conversation. And part of the reason as a group, as a human, I put time into bringing it up as points of conversation, as points of education in our music. That's what we try to do, educate about our beliefs, our understanding, and our studies of self and history in America, Turtle Island, the government, banking, and uh, our role in it. There's power in the people. I believe in the Hermetic Principles, so I believe in mentalism, and I also believe in domination. My personal belief on mentalism is uh, it is a real thing. It's just that we don't understand it much less practice it well at all. And so those who say, oh, I tried positive thinking, I tried intentional manifestation, visualization. If you watch the movie, uh, What the Bleep, you know, they talk in there about most people, their concept of positive, intentional thought is, you know, about 1% of their day. One, Not even 1% of their sum total of thoughts in a day, most of which are self-defecating and defeating and uh, not encouraging, not truly positive, much less focused through some kind of meditation or otherwise on what it is you are trying to manifest. So our understanding, much less our practice of mentalism is weak at best for most people. Of course, there's some people that have been studying and disciplined and working hard at manifestation and mentalism. So uh, that's the closest thing I have to modern day slavery. Um, as an actual form of slavery, which is very different than the transatlantic type of slave where, you know, you're restricted to do one cotton field, one property, one master, one, you know, acreage of land where you're all congregated as a group. This is like free range slavery through usury, where you get more benefits of movement and uh, illusion of upward mobility, but you're still capped off and re refrained by by debt, by interest that you know you'll owe your actual labor, your actual workforce to either maintaining what value our fiat currency has or paying back what it is we owe and whoever it is we owe that to. So I do believe in that that's a form of slavery, and I advocate for it. Our Jubilee album is uh, it's an album just about usury, 
about freedom from usury. Jubilee is the forgiveness and resetting of debts. I recommend going to check the album out, but just going to research usury and Jubilee in general. Um, so mental slavery, I do think, is a huge part of American culture right now. Um, when you look at all cultures, I mean, I think I was, I, I say, privileged to grow up with um, a diverse class of nationality, of races, of cultures, um, from Latino to black to indigenous to white, and also low economics. So no disrespect to whites, as they call white trash, black ghetto, indigenous reservations, and uh, Latino, same thing, you know? So I think it's important to have experience of the lower eco economics to speak on it, to speak on slave mentality, poverty mentality. And I know firsthand people that have no self-esteem, have no self-confidence, have no education, no wisdom, street smarts or book smarts on opportunity, on problem solving, you know, just organization on working hard, much less self-determination, what truly are your options and possibilities. Um, that's not just selling out and acclimating to the so-called white culture. It's um, integrating and understanding economics, period, um, prosperity, and what that looks like. And I do think that's tied to land ownership, and that gets back to colonization and domination in the wars, and I think that's an important part that the modern American white conservatives aren't totally addressing, because land ownership, land stewardess, stewardship, just the use, the access to land and resources is an important thing and it gives opportunity in the free market. And so in a history of America where that's been divvied out, there's not a lot of, you know, you can't homestead anymore. You can't just go claim land and start developing without opposition from the government. And so that's a real thing in self-determination in a true free market. And I don't think modern conservatives are really um, giving due respect to that discrepancy historically. And the argument is, well, today, whites, browns, blacks, the spectrum are all in the same boat. Most people don't have land ownership. We're not Ted Turner, right? Warren Buffett. So we most of us aren't that that type of one percent because even in the one percent of economic prosperity people that you know make million dollars a year something like that a lot of those people aren't necessarily like the true upper upper elite that have land i mean bankers they create money that's a whole different type of rich <laughs> that's that's not even like a bill gates or george soros something like that who's extremely wealthy or a ted turner so um, it's good to understand the levels <laughs> of economic prosperity and how that impacts the free market truly. Uh, much less free press, things like that that are really important, you know, when you still have, of course, you have access to go study. The internet is here. We have so much access to information and knowledge and potential to, again, be blaming even non-free media, you know, Viacom and the five major companies that distribute the most of what people are going to see on the idiot box. But that's the same thing. So what are we talking about? Are you subject to Viacom as your only means of information? Is that a form of slavery? Or do you really have the ability to go outside of your idiot box, get on the internet, go to the public library, go to actual people, to mentors, um, to other people that have libraries outside of the public library that have information handed down. Um, that's one thing. You look at the Masons that the Masons do, you know, handing down, archiving some of the most important information and in books and studies that they feel is relevant to the people in the communities they care about. If you go into the black community, there isn't a lot of that. 
honestly, you know, people's home libraries, the things like that that don't exist. Now, is that a choice? Does that come from the history of America? You know, just looking at black Americans in the pre-60s and, you know, the rise of the middle class black American where families were more intact. <clears throat> uh, it, there's just, it's a tough argument to say, to know what happened, to know what happened to the family, to single mothers, to children out of wedlock. Like, is children out of wedlock forced on people? Is crack as an active personal use, is that forced on people? I don't know a lot of people that were forced to smoke crack through white supremacy. I understand Oliver North, but I also understand Ricky Ross. I know that Ricky Ross was in the neighborhoods. Oliver North was not. So how did the crack get to the mouth of <laughs> black Americans throughout North America? So. I think that all gets back to Kanye West's statement. 400 years, is it, is it really 400 years? Is it a choice? Is it something forced on us? Um, you know, I think in in these dialogues, well, debates, because that's, that's part of it. We're seeing one-sided debates, polarized, bifurcated positions, aggressive positions, aggressive debating. And I think that gets back to debates versus dialectical. Are we working cooperatively for truth to really find, well, what is real? What, what is real with slavery? What is real with mental slavery? Or are we ego tripping, power struggling, trying to one up somebody, make them look foolish and stupid and us look brilliant and wise? Um, dialectical is not worried about looking brilliant and wise. It's concerned about being on the right track to truth. And so sort of wrapping this whole thing up, I think it's important to look at one-sided hypocritical arguments. You know, I've been online just watching people upset, like, you think slavery is a choice? You think poverty mentality is a choice? And they get so upset and start arguing about the places they can point where it's not a choice as though that negates any time it is a choice. It doesn't, and I think that's debating, that's not dialectical. And so you see that with the white conservatives. Um, let's talk about Black Lives Matter, you know, black mentality of gun shootings, police violence, police supremacy, white supremacy, white domination. We like, a lot of people refer to white domination as opposed to supremacy. Um, with and they view it you hear the white conservatives pointing out the hypocrisy you know well let's just take gun violence you know with black on black violence which for me if you're denying that i just it's hard to know where to start as a conversation and i, I that's where the whites that are bringing this up are coming from i totally get that because they it's viewed as hypocritical i relate it to feminism i'm i'm an anti-feminist and my problem with feminism is it's supposedly, supposedly a movement about equality, which is more egalitarianism, right? So feminism, to me, isn't egalitarianism. It's about female domination, female privilege. And that's why you don't hear feminists addressing any men's issues, because they're only worried about females' issues. And I think as a male, as a man, that's my opposition to feminism. I try to put myself in other people's shoes and relate as where I can relate things. And so I look at these two issues, you know, feminism of how I view that as hypocritical. You know, well, you never talk about the adverse. You never talk about your own responsibility or your own privilege and your own advantages. And that starts to seem disingenuous when you're one of the most privileged classes in the history of the world. And as a devil's advocate, I relate that to the white commentation on black and indigenous states today. You know, that blacks don't talk about their self-accountability in a lot of ways, which is, I think, what's implied by slave mentality. If you live in the hood, 
No, you don't. You shouldn't have to move. But most people, if they're living in a place like some of these spots in Chicago, where the murder rate is, it's unconscionable. It's so hard to fathom still what is going on in Chicago right now. I, I, my heart, it, it it impacts me. I'm from Milwaukee, and so to know like it's still going on, the gang bang and the, the black on black crime, the Latino, the gang on gang crime, the fighting, you know, brown, like what's happening in Chicago, you know, and we can get into the white influence on Chicago, but it's the same thing, the same with crack, you know, like most of the actual day to day stuff is coming not from whites to blacks, it's from blacks to blacks, right? And so you have to address that. If you can't take accountability for your own shortcoming, sh shortcomings and your own faults, then you're not working on self, you know? You're pointing at other people with four fingers pointing back at yourself and you can't even look at yourself. That's a form of narcissism or cognitive dissonance, you know, something. But it's not the epitome of healthy. It's not the epitome of self-accountability and progress. And so... I think my personal belief is there's both. There's been slave mentality and there's been actual slavery. There's actual oppression, historically and in modern America. And the bifurcating nature of how we argue in today's social media and just in general is a major part of the problem because we're not dialectical. We're debating, we're arguing, dialectical we're listening, we're doing active listening. So what I hear you saying is this, could you explain and just help me understand where you're coming from? Nonviolent communication, having some empathy for those outside of yourself, much less yourself. How would you speak to your own child with ignorance, faults, shortcomings? We try to do it with compassion and wisdom, lead by example. And so, um, I think we're seeing the same thing with hate speech, you know, those who tout out against hate speech. It's like the new thing. How bad hate speech is. You don't have the right. To, and a lot of these people are being hateful <laughs> while they're addressing hate speech, you know, and it's this conflict and hypocrisy, looking hypocritical, looking like your shit don't stink. And that's that's an issue. People are going to be defensive to that. They're going to have a sour taste when somebody uh, exemplifies that energy and that demeanor. Um, so I just want to talk about my own song, The Man. Getting hustled by the man for a hundred years. And that's why I have that song. And I think if you listen to it, um, I like to do a lot of self-reflection because I've grown so much. I've been doing music for 20 years, and so I'm a recovering socialist. You know, I, I subscribe to concepts I didn't even understand, especially in the early years of my writing, where I had um, utopian <laughs> visions of grandeur, and which I, I still believe come from a good place. Those that are stuck in the utopian philosophy and ideology that that could be are usually good-hearted people. They may be misdirected, but I think their heart is starts at least in the right place. That's how I feel for me. Um, but I've had to refine and critique and look at and take accountability for myself, first and foremost, for things I believed in and thought were truths and were, were my truth at the time, you know? And I think humility is essential to refining yourself to admitting when you were wrong, um, to hearing a new perspective that adds and improves your own. And so the track I have, I feel like I talk about 400 years in, I say getting hustled by the man. So I'm not talking about slavery, um, but I think it's closely related, especially mental slavery. And what I view as socialism in America, which created a lot of the downfall of people in general, of humans, of Americans. And so, you know, I reference the New Deal, which is socialism, social welfare, um, uh, to the Great Society Act and 
you know, Lyndon Johnson, much less FDR, from the original, I think, the beginning of American socialism, which was, you know, again, right after the centralized banks. And that's why I do believe in conspiracy fact, because I think that was intentional. It was intentional to create a welfare state and create a dumbed down populace that doesn't even know what that means, doesn't know what centralized banking means, doesn't know what a republic means or two thirds vote or limited government or constitutional or inalienable rights. Um, you know, I just saw something on healthcare as a human right. It's our concept on rights. What is a right? That's like entitlement. It, I, you know, we are so polarized and not on the same page as a country as Americans, but even as cultures. Um, I have so many debates with indigenous red culture, with black American Moorish culture, and certainly with white European culture here in America. Um, but I try to do it dialectical. I try to do it with bridging in mind, bridging the gaps harmony and unification, not separation and opposition. So, um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm open to the, I, that's why we're bringing it up. That's why I'm doing this video. Um, I'm open to critiques on my own songs. The man, um, if that's, is that hypocritical? Is that victim mentality? I do think it's dangerous, this thing we're seeing with social justice warriors, not just with social justice warriors, but with the opposition of this, there is social justice. Like I'm a social justice warrior, I feel like in my nature and that there's social justice issues, but certainly not in how it's defined today with snowflake culture and victim mentality and entitlement mentality. Um, I don't identify with that at all and a lot of the left liberal um, speaking talking points I don't feel entitled to a lot of what people call rights um, like health care that comes from government that comes from domination and taxation um, I'm open to very small limited forms of socialism but I'm far more open to charity and intelligence and limited government especially federal government um, I don't think we should be taken from people and given to other people uh, and that's the point of slave mentality that's the point of not having self-determination you know equal opportunity is not the same as equal outcome in this modern Marxist socialist society is about equal outcome not equal opportunity I think we gotta talk about it because I think it's incorporated with slave mentality 400 years of slavery and if we're going into socialism it's not about to end because modern socialism and I just think historical socialism isn't always just about freeing yourself from slavery as I think we see in American welfare state it's about not doing for self a lot of times when somebody provides you know teach them how to fish don't give them a fish but we want the fish most people don't want to do the work right now and I think for some good reason and for some self-imposed reasons. So um, I'm about end or ending polarized arguments, debating, at least minimizing it to the best we can within our power, because that's a good starting point. And then we can talk about anything. We talk about socialism, Marxism, slavery, self-imposed slavery, mental slavery, mentalism. Let's not even do just the negative. Let's do the positive. What's our goals? Prosperity, abundance, love, health vibrancy right so the contrast is here to define what it is we do want the greatest grandest vision of ourselves as neil donald walsh puts it let's start crediting people too like for these concepts greatest grandest vision of who we are like that's neil donald walsh conversations with god it's good to give reference to where you got concepts from and if he got it from somewhere else instead of the creator, then he can reference it, you know, but let people know where you get your information, where you're getting your facts and statistics so they can be challenged healthily, intelligently. Um, so we know what's you, what's somebody else. It all comes from creator. You know, I believe that. I believe that creator brings down concepts at the same time to multiple people. So property rights, intellectual rights, things like that are 
It's tricky. It's complex. I digress. All that is far off of 400 years of slavery. Kanye West crazy ass and opioid addiction. <laughs> um, stop being starstruck with these people. First of all, you know, Kanye West, that's just a human on opioids. It's like this starstruck society and Hollywood, you know, it's like... <sighs> Love, your, love the people in your own community, in your family. Look up to them. Who's your mentor here? Who's your idol that you physically know that you talk to? That's part of the problem is these kids are growing up thinking Kanye is more important than their own mama, than their own daddy, than the, the people that they study under. Yeah. So we're turning to YouTube faster than we're turning to the creator or people that we actually know, that we can see doing. You know, so um, let's minimize polarizing debate, middle ground. It's not necessarily just about finding a middle ground um, because sometimes it's not about ending up in the middle. You know, sometimes the true way is over here or over there. Um, but that's where dialectical will help us get to that open mind, I think, is more important than middle ground. Dialectical is more important than the concept necessarily of the middle ground. Um, you don't need to compromise on truth if it's really the right way. Uh, but having healthy dialogue to, you know, build your argument to prove yourself and being open and hum humble enough to be challenged it's how we get to the actual truth. So, slavery and mental slavery. They're both correct, y'all. Let's find some intelligent way to talk about it. <laughs> you don't have to pick one side or the other. We don't have to bifurcate on everything. I think they both exist. That's my reasoning why. So, more dialectical, y'all. Let's, let's work, let's build for truth. Keep building on information. My name is MCAD a.k.a. Rad Dad. I'm part of the freedom movement. We represent self, love, and improvement. Um, rhymesforthetimes.com, that's my website. You can get some music for the soundtrack for the revolution and the revelation. Be good to yourself and be good to others. I'm going to try to make shorter videos. They always seem to be a half hour or something in a McDonaldization of society, fast food culture. I may be for you, I may not. Time will tell. Peace and love. Be good. Co and tell and show and tell are very different things. One is for the kitties and one will get you framed. And one implies the government, dirty, dirty. Black lives shattered back in 1930. And a new deal, here's your certificate. Birth manifest social security. Looking for the mark of the beast. Every game piece here matters. Chessboard planet.